U.S. Senator for the state of Florida, my friend Marco Rubio. How are you, Senator? Good, Enrique. How are you? Good. Staying healthy, trying to trying to stay away from people. It sounds crazy, but yeah. That that you know? that mustache and beard is almost like a mask, right? Oh my goodness, it almost is. You know, my cousin cuts my hair, and and um, he tested positive for COVID. So he's been away for weeks. So I'm letting this grow until he's totally recovered and get his two negatives back. And then, he, you know, then, then I'll cut my hair. So I'm letting well, it grow. You, you, look like, you look like the guy from Flanagan's, except for white, you know? I'm Big Daddy <laughs> Flanagan's. What's, what's your favorite, uh, what's your favorite on the, the Flanagan's menu? The ribs. Ah, the ribs. you're a ribs guy. I love the wings. Yeah. You cannot beat the wings from, from Flanagan's. Yeah. And the Caesar salad. I'm telling you, the Caesar salad. And the, na- and the nachos. And all oh, the nachos are, are awesome. Yeah, they're awesome. making me hungry. Man. <laughs> We're going to have to get, get some food right after our, our chat. Senator, I know you're very busy. Thank you for your time. Listen, what's, this, what's going on? So China says that they're going to supposedly are going to retaliate after uh, President Trump has signed or signs this, this Hong Kong uh, sanctions bill. What, what is all that about? Can you explain this? Well, I know. This yeah, China it's my sanction? bill. It's- your yeah, bill, it's my course. bill. Yes. So, but, but, but the thing about it is this. In China, there's this uh, group of people called Uyghurs or Muslims. And the Chinese government has been putting them in camps. So upwards of a million people. And they basically put them in camps. They force them to change their name, renounce their religion, renounce their culture, you know, everything. Just strips them of everything. And so, I don't know, I'm just against labor, forced labor camps, you know, especially for a million people. It's a grotesque human rights violation. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the Muslim world hasn't spoken out about it because they don't want to upset China. So we've been pretty vocal. I met some of these people a few years ago. You know, I started with Tibet. You know, I got to know the Tibet issue through Richard Gere and, and others that have raised it. And then it moved to this one, which is even more, or just as horrifying, if not more. And so we passed the bill that basically said, whoever's responsible for setting up those camps and doing all this, you know, we shouldn't allow them to come in the U.S. and have business here and all that kind of thing. So they retaliated against me. I wasn't planning to go to China. I don't have any businesses in China. So it doesn't, it's really symbolic. But frankly, I mean, to be punished for that tells you you're on the right side. And, you know, I, I hope uh, we'll continue to do those things uh, to sanction the people that are responsible for that. Do, do any of these um, sanctions that supposedly they're, they're going to take against uh, America affect the U.S. Com- consumer in any way or no? Do we have anything to worry about? No, they're, they're, well, they're against individuals. But I mean, the, the sanctions that China's imposed on the U.S. for 20 years is cheating. I mean, they, they, if you think about it, a Chinese company can come to America and do anything they want, right? But a U.S. company cannot go to China and do business. And if they let you do business, they force you to have a Chinese partner. And once the Chinese partner figures out how you do your business, they kick you out and, and, and take over it. So that, that, they've been doing that for 20 years, and we let them get away with it because we used to say they were a poor country, let them recover. Once they get to the same place we are, they'll, they'll, they'll follow the same rules, and that didn't work. And now they are at the same place we are and still want to keep cheating. So that hurts people. Yeah, we have millions of jobs in this country that were wiped out. When we walked away from industry, right, factories, these were good jobs. Look at Flint, Michigan. Flint, Michigan, 25 years ago, had like a median income of like over $70,000. These were factory jobs making cars. All that stuff left. And these people got left behind, and now these, are, these communities are destroyed. And uh, that has to stop. We can't continue with that. There is a lot of hardship in the United States, of course, because of the, because of the pandemic. And there's a lot of talking back and forth about the second stimulus check. Will Americans see a second stimulus check? Is something in the works? I don't know. I mean, yeah, there's going to be, you know, between next Monday and August 6th, the three week period, the Congress is going to be working on this almost exclusively. You know, the, 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 the president has said he's open to it. House Democrats say they want it. So I think there's a chance that we could see something like that in addition to potentially um, additional the unemployment extension, you know, given the, un, you know, the uncertainties. The part I'm focused on is another round of help for small businesses. You know, it, it's helped a lot of uh, small businesses to sort of be able to keep people on payroll with all the uncertainty. So we're going to have to do something between now and then. Now, with all this doom and gloom, I also want people to know there's some good news on the horizon that doesn't get talked about enough. You know, we're probably a few weeks away from a new therapeutic treatment uh, based on antibodies, not not the plasma. That's going to substantially progress what we can do with, with treating patients. And there's already two companies in America on, in, in the final stages of the clinical trials. So we could have a vaccine probably before the end of the year, but maybe even earlier than anticipated. Those will be two big, big, big developments that will change everything. So we just need to hold on here, you know, do the best we can, just a few more weeks, if we could just hang in there and we can start to turn this thing around. It's not going to be like this forever. 
I, you know, it, it's tough, you know, we got to get there and we're trying to build a bridge to that day when we've got these things in place. So I don't know how many weeks that is, but it's not years and it's not right. m- months, you know, so, so we're getting closer. That's good news stuff. I hope it happens. We're heading in the right direction. On and, and some more good news that doesn't get repeated enough that I think we should be saying more often is that, you know, if you get COVID-19, it's not a death sentence. Uh, more, there's more people that survive COVID-19. Unfortunately, yes, there's people that do pass and do, some people do have a hard time and complications with COVID-19, but the majority of people will survive if you get COVID-19. Now, Senator, I got to ask you, why is Florida the epicenter of COVID? And did, did we get something wrong? Are we doing something wrong? Could we, do, could we be doing something better? Well, I think there's a couple of things that you point to. If you look at when the infection took off, June 14th, June 15th, it tracks almost perfectly two weeks, two and a half weeks from the end of May. What happened at the end of May is two things. Number one is COVID stopped bleeding the news. For, for a few weeks, the news, the number one issue on the news was the protests that were going on, not, not COVID. So that, you combine that with the reopening, and I think people calculated, you know, things are open again. You're not hearing much about COVID as you used to hear. And, and people start going out and doing what people do. Right. It's easy but to COVID was just people. as dangerous and just as contagious. Oh, yeah, though, no, it's right? just as yeah. big. But the numbers have flattened out. You know, they closed the hospital at the, at the youth center. They closed mm. the thing. I mean, it was all positive at that point, trending in the right direction. So, mm-hmm. you know, what happened is, we saw, I mean, I saw it. I don't know what you saw, but I saw it. You know, people start getting together for Father's Day yeah. at a home. And so there's a lot of evidence that a lot of this spread is not happening out at the beach. It's not happening out in an open you know, cafe or somewhere. It's happening at private gatherings as people get together with family. If I'm getting together with 10 people in my family, are people are all going to wear a mask? You know, so that, that becomes an issue. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of that was happening at, at the same time. And so, you know, that begins to add to it. And then, mm-hmm. and then, you know, the fear always was, if you look at the early numbers, I think it was the median age was 32. So it was a much younger population. It's now increased to 41. And what that tells you a little bit is because that's the median age. So it means half the people are older, half the people are younger. The fear always was, yeah, you're 25 and you have it. Maybe you got a fever. Maybe you had nothing. But you went home and a week later gave it to your aunt who's 69 or 70 and has a problem. And that's what we're starting to see a little bit of in the second wave. And that's the part that's concerning because it doesn't just stay with that person or everybody else you're interacting with. The other challenge we have is we have, I explain this to people, we, we, we take it for granted when you live and grow up in Miami. But in most parts of the country, you know, your family is whoever lives in your house. Your kids live halfway around the country, your brothers and sisters. Here, we have huge extended families. A lot of people never leave. All your kids and your family live within blocks. And so we have big extended families, and we have big family units living in the same home. I mean, and, and so that also adds to it a little bit. And so a lot of that, those sorts of things have played together here. You know, we're going to turn the corner on it, but it's tough. Yeah, I was, I was discussing that a couple of weeks ago with Dr. Fauci himself about the fact that, you know, in the Latino household, there's so many of us under one same roof. Sometimes it's, it's tough. It's more, it becomes more complicated to be able to effectively, you know, social distance. What, what, something that really bothers me also, Senator, is the fact that, you know, we've had to, in Miami-Dade County, for example, of course, in the state of Florida, we've had to go back now on, on, on that phase where we went forward uh, on restaurants, and the majority of restaurants, the ones that I visited, once the restrictions were lifted, were following the protocols. They were practicing social, uh, you know, safe social distancing, disposable menus, washing their hands, the masks. They were doing everything they had to do. And it's unfortunately unfortunate that so many, that they have, they have to pay, I'd say the, the bill, pagar el bill, como se dice en español, I was saying Spanish, you know, for the irresponsibility of other people, not social distancing, not wearing but, but- the mask. You know, if you talk to the doctors or the people that have really focused in on this, okay, it, I'm not going to tell you it's impossible to touch something and put it to your mouth and get infected. It's not, I'm not going to say it's impossible. And I'm not going to say it's impossible to be outdoors somewhere and some guy coughs, you know, 10 feet away and eventually mm-hmm. you breathe it in. But by and large, the way you get infected with this is either um, you, you have to breathe in enough of this virus, either because you're talking with someone up close mm-hmm. for a significant period of time, 15 minutes, they say. Or because you're in a closed setting and a lot of people are talking and it's circulating in the air and you breathe it in. Okay, so there's there's no evidence that restaurants were a source of an outbreak. There's no evidence that have there been cases involving restaurants and Publix and CVS. There have, of course, people get infected that work there, but there's no evidence that any places have been epicenters. So my only concern is you go to a business that's already operating on limited capacity and you close them. You've met the demand to do something, but I'm not sure you're going to lower the numbers if the mm. spread isn't happening at the restaurant. It's happening somewhere else. 
I'm not telling you it's impossible to get infected at a restaurant. I'm just saying that's not the source of a pandemic. If restaurants were the only place people were catching this, we wouldn't see the numbers we're seeing right now. Right. Because uh, it, this is happening in private settings. And, you know, that's up to us. I mean, government can't that's, ban that's those what, things. That's what's frustrating, though, because if that's the case, when I spoke to Mayor Carlos Jimenez, Miami-Dade County mayor, he says that's why he made that that determination. Because when he spoke to ex, experts, he says it's an ex, enclosed space the restaurants and there's more chance there's more likely a chance of someone you know being being infected because the restaurant is closed and that's when he then yeah. decided that if, if you have outdoor seating you the restaurant can you know see people outdoors but not indoors it's just unfortunate right. again that the that the restaurants are the ones that are suffering these small businesses you know when they're yeah, when, big time. I mean, when they're, they're following the protocols they're following the well, protocols. the one that, the majority the, the, majority. the one that's really sad is that you know a family-owned restaurant yep. 30 years it's your life savings it's everything you put into it. And, you know, you're not only are you being hurt by the restrictions, you know, part of it is people are watching the news and they're not going out. Right. So, you know, that, that's why the PPP thing we worked on was we're going to have to do it again because otherwise we're going to lose. These people are going to vanish I and mean, they're going to go away and they're never going to come back and the businesses are never going to come back. And, um, and it's, it's tough, you know, it's, a, it's something we're going to have to address and just, you know, hopefully we'll get back to that point fairly soon where people can start doing these things again. Senator, I got to ask you, where, where do you get your COVID-19 advice and information from? Where, where should we get that information from, if not the CDC, if not Dr. Fauci, our experts? Well, I think that certainly the CDC is an incredible source online uh, that I've relied on constantly. I talk to a lot of the hospitals. I'm always talking to hospital administrators around the country. And um, I, the people of the Department of Health, our universities, uh, University of Florida, FIU, both have public health uh, um, experts as well that you talk to. And, and you start to, and, and, and one of the things they'll all tell you is we're still learning a lot about this virus. I mean, this virus has been with us now for about seven months. So there's still things that they're learning about it. We learn so we something new about make, it every single day, right? Yeah. So you don't want to make assumptions about it that are not, that are not true, but, but we've now learned enough about it, you know, that, that you can talk to people and, and get that sort of advice about what it is that's out, the, how this spreads. And if you go to the CDC website, it says, you know, the primary way that this is being uh, spread is through close contact. But just about a week and a half ago, the World Health Organization changed their stance to say it, it's that and it's also aerosols, which is, you know, small droplets, but a lot of them circulating in a closed environment in the air have to be a cause of this as well. Because it's not just enough for you to cough on me one time, you know, and, and get it. You have to breathe in enough of it. So it's clearly happening. Both close contact and prolonged indoor uh, with big crowds are the two places they think are contributing to it the most. And, and that's sort of what you want to focus on in terms of your public policy. So you're not hurting people that have nothing to do with this. And the new information that came out this week that the more more infected droplets you inhaled, the the worse your infection could be. So that's yeah, interesting and that, as and well. That, and that's something, well, that's something they've suspected the whole time. That's why you'll hear the story of a young and healthy doctor or nurse get really, really sick because they've inhaled a tremendous amount. It's, it's dose dependent in that sense. Uh, and that's something they've speculated on for a long time. Senator, how do you feel about Dr. Fauci? I have no problem with him. You know, he is an important voice at the table. I mean, he's dedicated his life to doing this. And so I think from somebody in my position or a government position, you know, our job is you have a table of people that are giving their opinion, economic advice, medical advice, you know, social, all these different things. And he is an important factor. He can tell you what the science tells you, right? And so, yeah, the science tells you if you lock everybody up in their home and don't let them go out for two months, the numbers are going to drop dramatically. But the other guy's going to tell you, if you do that, you're going to destroy the economy. You know, domestic violence goes up, child abuse goes up, unemployment goes up, poverty goes up. So you have to balance these two things. I mean, that's what public policy making is all about, is you balance these different factors. He's an important voice in one of those factors. Um, he's not an economist. He doesn't claim to be an economist. He gives epidemiological advice. Um, and then you have to balance that with the other considerations. And you try to come up with a public policy that helps as many people as you can and hurts as few people as you can. And, and that's how you make public policy. And it's never perfect. It's a cost benefit analysis. Would you agree with me that he's a good American? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, he's dedicated his life to this work. I and, think the and, problem with the doctors and sometimes is they're the bearers of bad news. Right. You know, and, and uh, people and, should be uh, upset at, at the bad news, not the bearer of the bad news. He's yeah, not so the bad guy. Two heart, so you've had two heart attacks and the doctor says, Hey, this year, you know, you got to cut out like on the boy, no, 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 uh, <laughs> right. no pork or no, no pork rinds or whatever. And you don't like it. You're upset about it. You don't have to do it. You know, you could, you know, but he's going to give you the medical advice. And, um, and, and so I think that's oftentimes a situation that he finds himself in, 
where, where I think it kind of gets more conflicted, you know, is when he says, and the answer is we've got to shut everything down because now right. there's another consideration and that is, hold on a second. I mean, I'm not spreading this. My business is not spreading it. You're about to put me out of business and bankrupt me and put me into poverty for something I'm not causing. And that's why that balance is important. The attacks on his life and on his family, uh, you know, uh, the uh, conspiracy theories being spread online, are just very unfortunate that people would- Yeah, but that, that's part of it. Everyone's gone crazy. I mean, that's the biggest problem we have right now is, uh, you know, this politics has made everybody nuts. We're the, one of the few countries yeah. in the world that's politicized this. So if you wear a mask is now a statement of independence. I mean, doctors yeah. and nurses have been using masks for years. Uh, there's a reason why they use it. We didn't invent masks last week. And I always tell people, okay, if it has a 5% chance of getting people back to school, back to work, back to life, why not try it? I mean, it's not going to hurt right. anybody. So, you know, it's part of sort of this sort of anger and, you know, we've become a, a country where it's become irrational in a lot of these conversations. And we really, I mean, it shouldn't, it's not good, you know, and, and I hope we can you know, break this fever at some point. We are definitely resilient. We're a great country. And you know, like my dad always says, this country has always done well when it's, you know, when, when we go down the middle, not too far to the right, not too far to, to the left. And some people also on social media have gone so radical to say, oh, all Democrats are, are communistas. Cubans and Latinos like using that, you know, that, that word. What would you say to them that don't respect, you know, the political process and, and democracy here in the United States and they want to title everyone as, as communist just, to your, just because you pertain to a certain respected yeah, party? Yeah, so look, there are people in the, in the Democratic Party that I think are, are friendly to some of these causes. And there are people in the Democratic Party like my friend Bob Menendez from New Jersey, which who's my closest partner in taking on... Uh, uh, Maduro taking on the Castro regime, taking on uh, 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 the Ortegas in Nicaragua. So, um, by the way, there are people in the Republican Party that are in favor of, you know, lifting the embargo, which nobody has, everybody doesn't have to agree with me, but that's their view of it and, and things of that nature. So, you know, it's a little bit complicated. Obviously, look, if you're wearing a Che Guevara t-shirt and spray painting hammer and sickles on, on a statue, I think you're a communist, you know, and, and you probably are not in the mainstream of either party. If, you're, if your ideas, if you admit to everyone that you are a socialist because you want to see government run industry, you're a socialist. But, uh, but I think uh, by and large, you know, the, the, I, would, I think the core of American politics is neither. Now, there's a, that's, those are very strong voices in the Democratic Party that are pushing in that direction. Um, and I think that's always the challenge in American politics, right, is to sort of make sure that your policies and your views represent the majority of Americans and the common good. And that's just an ongoing struggle years in and years out. But, you know, I, I've always, on the issues of freedom and liberty, I've, I've tried to always, you know, keep them, whether it's my support of Israel or my support of, of freedom in Cuba, you want them to be bipartisan because, you know, you want as many people as possible, Venezuela, you want as many people as possible on your side in that regard. Sure. I want to talk about schools quickly. The vice president says, uh, we don't want CDC guidance to be a reason we don't open the schools. The White House says science shouldn't, stand in the way your kids go to school in florida um are you comfortable having your kids return to school yeah and, and just and just to be fair i'm not sure that that's exactly the terminology that kaylee used yesterday i haven't read it but i saw some conflicting reports but irrespective yes i, 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 heard, I heard her but, specifically say that where she says okay. uh, science shouldn't stand in the way of the schools okay. opening. like i said i didn't verbatim, hear, verbatim. i heard some other people saying that she didn't but that's fine your, your, your question is so my kids go to a public charter. My two boys, my, my girls are both graduated or in college now. And I would answer to you, I am comfortable assuming that the school takes certain steps because nobody in my house has an underlying health condition that puts them at high risk. I'm not at high risk. My kids aren't at high risk. Now, if my mom lived with us, if she was still alive and in the, the condition she was in, I might have a different opinion. So my view of it is that if you are, first of all, there are certain things schools are going to have to be able to do to mitigate the risk. And we've learned a lot. Look, daycare centers and nurseries have basically been open the entire time. A lot of people don't realize it. They've been open the whole time. And they've done something right because we haven't seen a massive outbreak at, nurse, uh, at daycare centers and nurseries for kids. Right. So what did they do? We could learn from that. They've opened schools in Europe. We could learn from that. I think there's a way to do it safely. Now, if you're a teacher that has a health condition or somebody at home that does, if you're a student that has a health condition or so, there has to be an option for you that doesn't force you back to school. So I'm not saying they have to open August 24th. Maybe it's September 15th. Maybe it's right. October 1st. The point is give people some certainty that they can build around. I do know this. There is a price to pay for keeping the schools closed. The learning losses are real. Uh, a lot of kids, their breakfast and lunch five days a week comes from school. So there's a nutritional aspect, a learning aspect, nutritional aspect. A, a significant percentage of child abuse cases are identified at the school. 
So they're there and, and parents can't get back to work and there's not a, how, how are you going to leave a nine year old at home alone in front of a computer while you go work during the day. So there's a cost that has to be weighed here as well. So our goal should be to open the schools as soon as we possibly can in the safest way possible. And every county is different. There are counties in Florida that are going to be able to open schools on day one because their infection rates are very low and they've put these things in place. Bigger counties with bigger challenges might have to wait a little longer and be more flexible. But it, 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 and we're going to get there. You know, we're not, I, I don't think we have to cancel the whole school year. I think we're going to be in a different place in November and December and January than we are right now. But we got to get to that point. 